Bay here. I work on Brown Foreman's bourbon portfolio, so Woodford Reserve, Old Forester, and Cooper's Craft. But if you can't tell, we're not doing whiskey today. Um, we've got some very special speakers here. They're two senior scientists, all the way from Louisville, Kentucky, who work for Brown Foreman. Um, Amber Lankin works on products, <coughs> and Amber Bennett works on product insights. Yes. Okay. Whew. Write yes. it down so I don't forget. And um, we're going to talk about Chambord today. So I know most of you are probably familiar with it, probably have it on your back bar, but you might not know much about it or even use it that often. So we're going to go through the deconstructive tasting, really what makes Chambord unique, the liqueur category, and then we're going to do a competitive tasting at the end. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm going to turn it over to the Ambers, and uh, we'll get started. Please give them a hand. Thank you. Thanks for having me. call it that way, it's the Ambers, but we do a ton of work together, so everywhere we go, we're the Ambers. There's <laughs> actually another Amber that works with us too, so it's kind of amazing. Um, but I'm Amber Bannett, I, like Shannon said, work in Louisville, Kentucky, we work for Ralph Norman's headquarters. Um, I have been in Product Insights, which is within research and development for like 13 years, I think. Um, my background is actually in psychology, so uh, my first career was as a psychologist, which burnt me out like in a matter of a year, you can imagine. Um, and then I kind of fell backwards into, hey, do you want to work with humans and how they relate to alcohol? And I was like, uh, yeah, that sounds like an amazing way to use a psychology degree. So um, that's what I do now. I no longer do therapy, but I um, study <coughs> consumers and um, bartenders and learn about their interactions with our liquids and how to uh, best bring them sort of insights to market. So I'm Product Insights. I work extremely closely with the other Amber, as I actually refer to her, um, and her team, who are the developers who actually make our products. So my job is kind of to take the insights from the market, identify white space and innovation opportunities, and then work very closely with them to actually bring it to life um, and make sure that what they're bringing to life matches what our customers um, are looking for. And I am the other Amber. I'm Amber Lampkin. And as um, was mentioned, I'm in product development. And I've been with Brown Foreman for, in three weeks, it'll be 17 years. So, um, <laughs> so this was my first big girl job out of college. Um, while I was in college, I bartended at a restaurant. And so I know that this could be early for you all. So thank you all for taking your time to come um, I started Brown Foreman in analytical, so I did all of the analysis that we're going to talk about in the presentation, so worked with a lot of high-tech equipment, um, was very amazed that some of our equipment cost a half million dollars and we have a room with uh, probably 30 million dollars worth of equipment when I think about like, gosh, I just wanted a car and this equipment was how much money, a couple houses, yeah. So um, I moved to product development and it was a uh, just a very bold move because I don't like to cook. Um, I'm very methodical. I have to follow everything like so um, in a bar being, oh, you just make it this way. That drove me crazy. Um, but product development is actually a lot more than just recipes. Um, we make products all over the world, my group does. So there's three product developers in Brown Foreman and we're responsible for all of the new products that come out if there's anything added to it other than alcohol. So we do not work on straight whiskeys, but Chambord, uh, country cocktails, um, any of the RTDs, honey, fire, apple, all of that was developed within my group. Um, so we can get started. Um, we want this to be very relaxed, so if you all have questions, just shout them out. Um, any comments, anything that you want to add from your experience, just feel free to shout out. I'm not formal, and then if it is formal, then I'm going to get like, super nervous, so the more informal that we can be, and if I can maybe drop a fresh word now and then. But I Do it. I'm going to feel way better about things. Don't Fuck worry. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <make me. laughs> yeah, thank you. That helps my nerves a lot. So, um, yeah, we're going to dig, I'm going to kind of lead the pony and Amber's 
as she mentioned, is extremely technical, and we'll make sure that she fills in all the details, because I tend to like details sometimes. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take you through um, the production process, and we're going to kind of smell and taste and experience this Sean Board liqueur in its deconstructed state, so that you really learn more about the product, and then hopefully can find new ways to use the product. Um, do you guys have Sean Board at your bars? Do you use it? How many of y'all use it? Just let everybody? Not as many as, not everybody in the room. How many knows what it is? So everybody knows what it is. How many people use it? So much, much less use and know what it is. So um, when I first came to Brown Foreman, the only thing I knew to do with this was pour it over vanilla ice cream. <laughs> so legitimately for like the first five years of my career, I was like, oh, we're having ice cream? Well, I get to use my own more. Because I think everyone kind of struggled on what to do because the flavor profile is so intense. Um, but now that I'm, you know, further along in my career, I've learned that this is an extremely versatile liquid. You just have to know what to do with it. So hopefully we can shine some light on that and get you guys to use it a little bit more. We'll get more hands ready for the easy part. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yep. Okay. The tasting um, uh, map in front of you, we're going to go through each piece of that. So um, if you've been anxious already, don't worry about it, but we'll go through and have these uh, any questions before we get started about like Brown Foreman or so Brown Foreman acquired Shell Board in 2006. Um, so we we had the brand for quite a while. It was here whenever I first started. So um, okay, we're gonna jump. So we couldn't be scientists with our full science and jackets on if we didn't talk about like regulatory stuff and the super dry part of our job. You guys heard the TTV? Yeah, we freaking love the TTV. <laughs> um, <laughs> off it. I'm dealing with him this week trying to get him to do work for me. I'm like, um, anyway, so we're going to talk about how shop work fits in according to TTV um, definition. So most of you may know or maybe don't know that basically every beverage alcohol has a class and type. That's how TTV um, categorizes everything. So class is like a really broad category. Um, Amber, you've made the analogy of like it being a binder. It's a big binder. Yeah. And then you're going to have file folders within that binder to further break this down. Right, which is going to be your type. So distilled spirits may be a class, and then vodka is going to be the type of product within that distilled spirits class. Jean Board, where does it fit? So Jean Board is a liqueur, that is its class, and its type is the black raspberry. And um, because it's liqueur, TTV regulations say that it must be more greater than or equal to two and a half percent weight by weight of sugar, um, and then it has to have a minimum ABV of 15%. Chambord is 16.5%, and I think we're around 26% sugar, so we definitely need those um, classifications. TTV will check us on all of these things, so this is something that in the production facility we have to make sure that we are getting. What does that uh, 2.5% translate to when you went crunch and shit earlier? That's perfect. 25, <laughs> 25 grams per liter, of, at least 25 grams per liter of sugar. At least 25. Yes. <coughs> 25 grams per 100 mils, so 25 percent, yes. So, sorry, 250 grams per liter, 25 per 100. Cool. Yeah, she does all the math. Her. 
Any questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, all are out. Anything that missed here? All right, so we talked about specifications for Sean Gord. Um, we have some extremely expensive, like Amber mentioned, um, instruments in our production facility at Sean Gord. Um, these particular specifications is what the TTV really regulates us on. Um, the proof, sugar is not really regulated. They just want to make sure that we're above their minimum sugar. Um, and then our color, th these are specifications actually, other than proof, that we set on ourselves. Sean Gord is an extremely natural product. So we have to spend a lot of money getting these extremely ridiculously expensive high-tech instruments to measure everything because we have to make adjustments to kind of fit with the, the natural aspect of it um, to make sure that we're hitting the specifications that we've developed over the years. I think you had stuff to add. Like, to yeah, add so um, we are making Chambord in France. We have to import it into the United States. And before we can do that, the government wants us to provide a sample and they want to analyze the sample. So that's with any import. Um, you go through the TTD, you get a free import analysis. So every, I think it's six years, we have to resubmit a sample of Sean Moore to the government, and they analyze it and make sure that we are at least 16 percent, or not at least, we cannot be over, so that we're 16.5 percent alcohol, and then our sugar is at least a two and a half percent. <coughs> And they don't care about the color or anything. But so um, we measure them. So oh, my money is this fancy thing. Look, check it. <laughs> this fancy thing, tell me if I'm wrong, is a spectrometer, correct? And that's how we measure color. So we're really pretty anal about the color of Sean Ward because it's we're really proud of it. We think it's a gorgeous color. Um, so every batch we measure color with a spectrometer. This guy is a density meter, right? An alkalizer. And an alkalizer. So that gives us our ABV. Yeah? Yep. After we distill it. So we have to distill this product. And so this is the way whiskey is made. So if you're, you've been to a distillery and there's the huge distillation bowl, that's exactly what we do um, in the lab whenever we have a sugary product. We need to get everything out of that product in order to find out the true alcohol um, and so we are distilling it just like a uh, whiskey distillery would. So this is full strong wait, wait, wait. And then this is the finished alcohol that's coming off and there's no sugar, there's nothing that can interfere because this machine looks at sugar and it says, oh, that's alcohol. Here we go. So we do not want any type of interference. So we distill um, and then we redo this machine. What are you distilling? We're distilling the actual Chambord product. So we take from this bottle, we pour it into flasks, and um, we heat it up at about 96 degrees. The alcohol, the ethanol starts to come off. And then this machine has a infrared, and it is taking that alcohol, and it is reading um, based on a gauging manual. So that's something that the distilleries use um, a lot because they don't have to worry about the sugars, but um, we just distilled all the sugar out. Now we have a gauging manual inside of this machine using it as its brain, and it will tell us the true alcohol. What's the general yeah. alcohol level? Whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. So um, we get plus or minus, we do, I keep saying plus, I work a lot with Europe. So uh, <laughs> we are not allowed to go over because God forbid that we give away any alcohol um, in the United States. Without the taxes. Yeah, without tax, yes. And so we no. are allowed minus 0.25% alcohol. And so um, the government actually goes out within stores and pick, they pick um, products, not just from corner products, every product, and they will do spot checks. And if you are under or over, they will come in and um, this actually happened to us. They got a product and it was over by like a .00 something. And they came in and they sat with our QC and they ended up learning that the <coughs> instrument was not set on a right um, method. So it was, yeah, it caused a lot of gray hair, but at the end of the day, it was a great learning for us and also for the TTP. What, what are they distilling 
to get the alcohol to make shit. So you take, basically you're taking Sean board. No, 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 he wants to know what alcohol is. What's the base beer? Oh, good question. Okay. Wait, totally put in the part of the so this yeah, is we're going to get quality it. control quality yes, this is, Yeah, we're just talking about scoring quality control stuff right now. I love it. And <laughs> she does too, so. <laughs> this is high. This is from batch to batch, on board, it's going to be the same um, within these uh, standards. So um, my group will decide what standards, and this is going like pretty technical, so forgive me, but um, I do love this part. So uh, hang on, let her do her thing. <laughs> we test for alcohol, so we develop the specifications and then we give them to Sean Ward. And Sean Ward has to test this each time. Then we also receive monthly samples back from Sean Board to make sure that our instruments aren't differing at all. So alcohol, um, density, so um, the alcohol is obvious. The density is going to tell us, is there the right amount of sugar in the product and is the alcohol right? Well, we're doing the distillation to feed the alcohol, but the density is telling us is the right amount of sugar going in. Um, we look at pH, so that's monitoring the acidity. Um, this product uh, does not have this, but we also look at titratable acidity. So we use um, sodium hydroxide, put it in the product, and it's kind of like in your science lab where the litmus paper would turn blue or red. Um, that's what one of our machines does, and that tells us if you're adding acid. So if you have a country cocktail and you've added acid to it, is the right amount of acid going in there? We don't have to do that for this. Spectrophotometer color. Um, that's what that machine is measuring. There's another machine that looks very similar to this, and it's measuring the turbidity. How cloudy is the product? If a, cl if a product is cloudy, um, there's particles suspended in there. You're not necessarily going to see uh, particulate. But over time, as the product as that weighs down, it's going to be in the bottom of your glass, so or the your bottom of your bottle. So juice is very cloudy on that machine. Um, if you have juice sitting around, you have stuff in the bottom of your bottle afterwards. <laughs> and I think that's everyone all this stuff is cool. yeah. So um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work going into making sure that your product is a quality product each time that you open a new bottle. You're not going to have to re-describe any of the taste profile of that bottle. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the distillation. So I mean, when you are making this kind of thing, like you're distilling from fermentation, you guys are distilling from a product for the purpose of elimination. So like, how different is the solution? Well, can, can we make sure that it's not distilling for the product? Yeah. It's assuming, but it's so the Yeah, so you're trying yeah. to eliminate it. You're right? basically just separating those yeah. higher alcohols from the non-alcohol. Yeah. So alcohol will come off of this heat. The boiling point of alcohol is very low compared to uh, if we have sugar water or something like that. So um, this machine is set to a certain boiling point. So this thing's boiling, boiling, boiling. And the only thing coming out first is alcohol. And so once it gets to a certain point on the bottle, there's a line, and that will tell us stop, there's no more alcohol coming out. Now you're starting to get secondary, a secondary burn or distillation, which might be sugar or um, any solids coming over, which will interfere. And so if you think about whiskey, there's a distillation, the distillation is going on, so the, uh, you have your fermentation, and then you're starting to boil off every, all of the solids and everything that's in that fermentation. It's to be a little longer. Yes. So trying to get all the it is um, it's not higher temperature so it just takes longer yes good questions all right so i have a question uh talking about like the color is there like a certain like color like point you're reaching for like uh like a dupont like paint coat or is there like a very significant because obviously you're dealing with natural ingredients not all black or the same black and like you adjust because of like where you yes. source them or seasonal yep yes and we have a color target that's measured on the spectrophotometer through absorbance okay. um, and so we've got i don't know how, how plus or minus it is but there's a color target that we blend to 
and we've got to make changes to the blends a lot in order to hit that target because of the variability in the berries. So um, the sensory group has shown that the, the human eye can't see a difference in color plus or minus 2%. So we'll set our color range based on several blends of batches. Um, and then we can go plus or minus 2%. Um, if we were dealing with some of our other products that we add caramel to, um, Jack Honey, we add caramel to that. If our color is, with, uh, is out of that spec of plus or minus 2%, then we can add color back or we can re-filter to take some of that color out. But this product is all natural, so if it is out of spec, then we write a variance and we put it through a sensory panel to make sure that you cannot see the difference. Um, it's not over, if it's over that two and a half percent and it's out of spec, then we want to make sure that the panel cannot tell the difference. We all totally pull her technical change. <laughs> <coughs> She's going to geek out on this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other questions about all this technical stuff? Before we move on to kind of how it's produced and tasting the difference. This little machine is about $150,000. <laughs> so let me know. We have more of them on that. So, yeah. We will give you our address. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're going to jump into the production. So um, you may or may not know all of Chambord is produced in the Loire Valley of France um, at a very, very beautiful site where the Chambord Chateau sets. Um, there is a, a very old and beautiful building where um, there it is. That's the chateau. Yeah. But you see the gorgeousness of it all. Um, so basically, there are four main components that make up Chambord. Um, there's this neutral alcohol base, which are actually neutral French spirits. Um, is what we're actually distilling off. You had asked that question earlier. Um, that we add some sugar to, and that's kind of our base of Chambord. Um, to that base goes into a berry infusion. We have flavor concentrates, which we'll talk about and taste, um, and then cognac. So we're going to go through each of these four different components. But basically, when you think about Chambord, these are really the building blocks of the Chambord liqueur. And our competitors, so some of our competitors have part of this building block, but then some of them are a liqueur in the sense that they have neutral spirits. They have vodka, flavors, and sugar. And so it's a, it's a liqueur, it's a very generic liqueur. So um, they don't have the craftsmanship that Chambord has. So um, the whole point of this is, is to inform you a little bit more about the process. So um, also want to inform you how we're different than our competitors. So um, Razzmatazz is one of those. They I was like, I wasn't going to say it, but you're going to get to experience one of those vodka yeah. sugar flavors. Yes. Are you guys the only cognac based uh, liqueur? As far as I know, yes. So um, looking at the competitors that you all have, they do neither uh, of the three. I thought, maybe not. No, um, they do not have the additional brown spirit of cognac added. N neutral alcohol is what grape? Is that what you're distilling? No, we're um, we are distilling its grain, so it's not. That's grain. my question. Okay. Yes. Grain. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're kosherable and um, we're not brown because we're not grain. Yes. You guys distill all of your own, or you don't import any neutral spirits, or you distill it all yourself? We are not distilling, no. Okay. So we have a we have one supplier that we are purchasing um, all of our neutral spirits from. And then we also have identified a contingency supplier if this if anything ever happened. So yeah. those suppliers, <laughs> right. all our yes, yeah. yes, yeah. they're, they're French neutral spirits. So same with the cognac too. Same with the cognac. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's dig into each of these components. So, like I said initially, basically, <coughs> the base building block of the board is this French neutral grain spirit um, and sweetener. So the first step in the process is we kind of create this base by mixing the neutral spirit and the sugar. And that's our building block to which we're going to add the berry infusions, the flavor essences and concentrates, and then coming out. Um, so it's basically just our blank slate for the building. <coughs> Board on it. Um, we use all natural 
granulated sugar, no high fructose corn syrup at all in this product. Um, we're really proud of all of our natural ingredients. We know it's expensive, but we think it's worth it in the long run. So. Miss anything here? All right, so the most important piece of Chambord Le Pure is the fruit infusion. It is what makes Chambord Chambord. Um, so the fruit infusion is consists of raspberries. So this is all on your all's, you know, in case anybody hadn't had a raspberry recently. But. Anyway, raspberries, super sweet. Um, hello, poor, small little hairs for those of you who are not familiar with raspberries. Blackberries, a little bit more tart. They're a little bit shinier. They don't have those little hairs on them. And then the black currant, which we had to get dried black currant because it's not available in this area. Fresh currant. Um, if you aren't familiar, it's extremely tart, very aromatic, um, got a lot of tannins in it. It's very drying, kind of, if you taste it. You can taste these, but I think they're significantly sweeter, these dried ones are, than what the fresh um, currants are. But that is basically the berries that go into Chambord with your, it is very raspberry heavy. These other ones are added to create more of a complex and more depth into the flavor profile. Um, we source all of our berries. We have suppliers that we work with in both the northern and the southern hemispheres because we want to make sure that we have a continuous supply of fresh berries. Um, so when the north gets cold, we head down south, and when south gets too hot, we head up north. Um, We've got a significant number of farmers that we work with um, that we've quality tested throughout the years. I think, I don't even know how many off the top of my head, but um, these farmers are basically working for Sean Board and they grow the berries for Sean Board. So they're held under really strict um, quality parameters as well for our berries. Um, so the, the berries themselves are a raw ingredient for us. So a raw ingredient might mean, uh, might be a flavor. So we might have a cola flavor. And we test that every time that it comes in. Um, we look at specifications. So we, with the farmers, have developed specifications on the berries. So whenever we buy the berries and we get our shipment in, we will analyze those. So um, we analyze them for the uh, sugar content. We analyze them for the number of berries that are broken. Like as nervy as that sounds, um, we, want our, we want our berries to be whole. Um, we get more of the um, more of the fruit notes coming out. So uh, whenever we're doing the maceration, which we're going to talk about next, so we can only have a certain percent that are striated, they're broken. So yeah, it's pretty. That's a little nerdy above my level. A production facility in <coughs> in the U.S. In France. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So those are all the berries that go into making fruit infusion. So now we're working on this first little jar, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is how we make this, which is actually the fruit, the Chambord infusion. Um, so like Amber said, all of this fruit comes whole. Um, it's inspected. Experts that have been food making Chambord for 15 plus years know what to look for. They approve the batch. It's all loaded up into this big venomatic type tank. Um, to which we add 28% neutral spirits. Um, and that is actually we've determined through nerdy research and development methodology that 28% ABV is like the best ABV to get the best fruit extraction. You go too high and you start burning up the fruit, you go too low and then you, you don't get enough of the extraction the essence from the fruit. So, so this is an infusion like you all might make on your bar for a special. For tonight we're gonna infuse vodka and pineapples. This is the infusion of raspberries and black bear, blackberries and blackberries. So this is exactly that. It's a very drawn out process. And we have a proprietary proportion of each of those different fruits that we put in there. Like I said, it's raspberry heavy, but we know it's X percent raspberries, X percent blackberries. Um, so basically all of that gets put into this big venomatic container. It sets for four weeks where it's rotated every 12 hours. It's kind of stirred up. Um, so we infuse for four weeks. That juice is all drained into a holding tank and it is affectionately called the first juice. It stays there, the liquid piece of that. All of the fruit is still in the, the uh, venomatic. And at that point we add more fresh alcohol to that and it sets for another two weeks and is rotated out for another two weeks. That juice is drained. We affectionately call it the second juice. So now we've got the first juice, we've got the second juice, and we've got fruit still setting in the venomatic. 
six weeks later. And at that point, um, that fruit is macerated. So it is all squeezed, every last ounce of juice and flavor and compound that we can get out of the fruit, we get out. Um, and that remaining liquid is called the third juice. So we've got first juice, second juice, third juice. We've basically gotten every bit of oil, essence, flavor that we can um, out of these berries. And all of that takes about six weeks. Um, I was talking about sound with the longest bitter components if you first have a full extraction from our end. Correct. So you can see what you should get any kind of bottles of our bitterness. In that last compression? Or to me, I promise it's going to show you're saying, how do we maintain the bitter note, or how do we? The top right there says it's not solid, it's But how, how is it selectively not doing that? So the, um, isn't the next slide the picture? Yeah. So look that. Yes. So there, I'll just look at it. So um, there's an auger, and it is pressing just so delicately that it isn't pulling every single component. These are looking more for the sweet aromatics and the, the sugary notes. So if we were pressing hard, we'd get the skin and everything, and that's where a lot of the bitter notes are coming from. We used to have a picture of this olive thing that does the pressing. That was pretty good. I, just, I, I might have been a little bit dramatic. I'm not sure how <laughs> <laughs> Not that aggressive. <laughs> Get all the good stuff out and leave all of that skin, that bitter skin stuff, is left behind. Um, I think that's actually wait, wait, hello. I think that's actually like kind of a picture of the middle of the maceration process. Yeah. So it's it's still kind of together. We haven't completely destroyed the structures of the product. So this is loading the fruit. So we receive the fruit in these huge bundles, and now we're unloading it, and it is being on an escalator to the machine where it soaks. This um, is, no, are you talking about that? Yes, this is Fabian Golet. Yes, as I say, he's been there for over 20 years. This dude does nothing but make shampoo. He is our master. He has invented every single piece of the product. Yeah, so he's kind of a bad. So in this picture, actually, he's taking all these different juices and mixing them together to make the infusion. To that base yeah. So, like you said, you, you guys analyze the sugar content and compounds longer before you macerate. Do you guys, based on that, actually like change? Is there a variance to what you're putting in the thing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, you, like how much of a variance? On, like, generally? Um, it generally doesn't vary a whole lot. So, um, based on the spec, that's a compilation of the last ten batches of berries that we've gotten. We'll reanalyze the spec and say how much has the product shifted just due to rainfall, how much has the product changed because of weather. So we're getting a pretty big range of plus and minus in that average and then we will go back and say um, we're looking at 26 grams that we need to add versus 34. So it's we it's changes but it's not drastic. Yep. So on your um, super cool tasting mat here, this first little bottle that says INF is the infusion. So that's what we just talked about. This is all that we get from the berries. First juice, second juice, and then the press. Yep, yeah, all mixed together. You are welcome to taste it. It will not hurt you. It will probably stain your teeth. It is ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry, I saw people do it. Um, which is why we have these cool little smelling strips. So if you just want to kind of dip it in there and smell and taste it. Um, that might save your teeth, either that or grab some pressed white strips, maybe as you might have. But yeah, it's, it's, it'll stay. When you've been double dip, you don't need to take these back, so if you just taste for a taste for a It's super duper jammy. I mean, that's what I get on the nose. It's like all very jammy. So the deep, dark color of Chambord, this is where it's coming from. This is fair. We don't add any additional flavors at all. It's all naturally or colored chumboard. We don't add any additional color to it all. Um, it's all coming from this berry. And this is why the product browns also from this component. This is a huge component of the recipe in final chumboard and because it is natural and it is a juice, it oxidizes. So 
you have orange juice that sits out at room temperature, it's going to turn a different tint, a different shade. And so the, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the browning, if you put this in your window seal, it'll probably be brown within two days. But um, the product on the bar isn't being exposed to all the ultraviolet light and UV. Um, so it is preserved for longer, but it eventually will brown no matter what. What's the uh, hardest variant for you to control during production? Definitely the color. Color, color and I would say sweetness, but because we can backfill with the um, sugar, but the color is what it is. And then two sucks do you think they Yes. Um, we have a second bottle, and that helps us to um, overcome any of that flavor change. So if we were only using the natural berries, we would definitely see some changes due to oxidation. But we complement this with the second bottle, we'll talk about in a second, which helps us preserve the um, natural fruit, fruit flavors. Uh, very question. So, like, <laughs> like I'm very proud of, like, uh, specifying this, like, black raspberries, like, certainly they kind of grow in the southeast part of the country. Like, what's the main difference between a black raspberry and a raspberry? It's like, one more distinct flavor, yep. or source, like, a more Did you try item. So, raspberries, the red raspberries are really sweet. Okay. Black raspberries are a lot more tart. Interesting and fact, black raspberries are our, our, um, um, they're primarily grown in the Pacific Northwest, North, yeah. Northwest of the United States. Okay. So um, you can grow them in Kentucky, but it's going to be your crop is going to be scarce. So um, for Chambord, the black hair, black raspberry portion, we are sourcing that out of Washington State. So um, that climate, that um, wet, cool climate is what gives the black raspberries its uniqueness. Yeah, you can buy, I, I can buy, can you buy, buy them down here? I see if you see them in the grocery store. Yeah, it's black raspberries. You know, I thought they were too, but they're not, they're different. Yeah, they're um, yeah black berries are pretty sweet. Black raspberries are pretty tart. I mean, they're, they're not as sweet as, as typical raspberries. <laughs> yes, and they're small. They're not, they're more like dense. Like blackberries, I feel like I'm the one Yeah, we're not technical. And with your berry extraction, are you doing raspberry extraction? No. no. Like they're all mixed together. Yeah. Yeah. That would seem to be a lot of berry control. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is. And from the sweetness aspect, um, that's something that's very hard to catch. As you can imagine, like you go to the store and you got strawberries and they're juicy and just so sweet and perfect, or even tomatoes, like, and then you buy them a week later and they're from a completely different batch. So that's why Sean Ward is buying um, all of their fruit and we actually freeze the fruit. So we buy 120 tons of fruit and we freeze this fruit. Um, another cool fact about freezing the fruit is whenever you're breaking down the frozen compounds that um, are in the fruit, you're actually getting more of the aroma, more of the sweetness that comes out whenever this is thawing out. So between the first and the third juice, like how many liters is in the batch of the How many liters of juice come out to yeah. Oh Lord, I don't know, a lot. <laughs> like, yeah, like bigger, um, 10, 5, 10 gallon. Things. We had that in our original presentation, and my boss gave that to some people at work, some marketing people, and they were like, holy shit, that is so technical. <laughs> so we, we took out, it. yeah, and of course you are asking this question. <laughs> Do you guys take any steps, or are there any additives that you do add to sort of arrest that out of oxidation? No. So as Amber mentioned, and we'll talk about, there's other components that I mentioned that go in called, we call them concentrates, but they're flavor essences, and we use them um, to kind of backfill for some of the variability we see in the berries, and we use them to add complexity. Um, I, they 
add a little bit more stability to the product when the book is 100% reduced, but we do not add any preservatives or anything like that. So it's, it's going to brown. I mean, yeah. we're not going to lie to you about it. It may take a year, but it's going to brown eventually. So even adhering to your starch color specification, you do not add anything? No. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but so in this six-week process, do you guys at any time have to fight while the fermentation process is happening? No, no, because of the alcohol that's added at 28%, it is, um, it's acting as a preservative, so any alcohol over about 12% will act as a preservative, and we won't, we won't get any of that. So you're pressing this with alcohol? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, at uh, 28%, right? Got yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 that keeps any fermentation or something. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. All right, are we cool? We know everything we need to know about berry infusion. We'll move on to concentrate. Who knows? So like I mentioned, that's another component um, are these flavor essences. So flavor concentrate, what we affectionately call flavor concentrate one, um, basically consists of raspberry essences and blackberry, black raspberry essences. I don't think about blackberry. Um, because our juice infusion, our berry infusion is so variable because it's a natural product, this is kind of what we use to backfill a little bit to make sure that we're comfortable with and we're meeting a flavor specification. Um, again, you've got this on your tasting tray, C1. You're welcome to taste it. Very highly concentrated. It will stay. Um, it's very, very, very forward. So it's all natural essences that's derived from the berries, um, but much more concentrated than the natural berries that we used earlier. Yeah. So when you make that, you're going to be able to get it. It's basically like the oils from the, these natural oils from fruits. So it is an actual extraction that we are buying these from a flavor supplier and we're doing the same quality checks. You have uh, a pre shipment that comes in, what, two to four weeks before? Yeah. And we, of the lot that we're purchasing, and we're going to make sure it falls within our standard. We'll make finish on board with it, make sure that it fat fills in these. Gaps that were um, a cause of this infusion, uh, but it, it's essentially a flavor that we purchased. Um, one thing to note is this flavor that we're this concentrate. All of there's three flavors in here, right? Three. All are purchased from the um, parfum region of France. So um, the flavor suppliers are highly, highly specialized. Um, it's a really awesome place to visit. Uh, very, very Sean Board esque. Very <laughs> bougie, yes. Are these all some natural flavors? Yes, yes, yes. yes. But are these uh, the syrups of alcoholic? Uh, alcoholic. So, yes. All of the flavors are um, basically preserved with an alcoholic base as well. But is it none of the things are identical? Or no, no, no. It's EU natural, which is. Um, we could be nature identical, we can be TTB natural, but EU natural is the highest standard of flavors, um, and that means that it actually comes from the fruit. So, um, Brown Foreman has everything. One of our um, requirements from as a product developer is we're sourcing only EU natural flavors because if you look at the Brown Foreman portfolio, we may have a project for the US or for Spain, but within two Years, we're going to start to launch everywhere, and instead of reinventing the wheel and have to find a flavor match, then we've already done that by starting out with these natural flavors. Basically, you've got flavors that come from the actual product that are natural, and you've got flavors where I can take chemicals and mix them together, and it smells like apples. And we don't mess with those. Those are not brown. We use the ones that actually come from. This is how I learned it, being not a flavor. Realizing that the process specifically is probably proprietary. What is the general process of making these essences? Like how are they derived? Um, a lot like this maceration. So they'll actually, be, it depends on what it is. So citrus, it's going to be a lot different than berries. So but the berry process is like stomping the berries. Um, it is um, doing a berry press. Um, they are allowed to backfill it. So, this has to be 98% from the natural fruit, but they're allowed to backfill with 
not vanillin, but vanilla. They're allowed Tabasco with 2% actual um, natural compound, not compounds because that's chemical, but natural products. And, um, but the berry itself is from a press. The citrus is from a distillation. So when we get citrus, um, oil, and alcohol, don't mix. So they remove all the oil from the citrus by doing a distillation, and then that's what that product is. So it's very dependent on what the flavor itself is starting out at. All right, everyone got flavor concentrate one down. So now we've got the berry infusion, we've got the flavor concentrate one, which is used to backfill the new variability we find from the natural berries. Um, and then we have flavor concentrate two, which I think is super cool. I think it adds what a lot of what makes Chambord Chambord. So it adds a lot of this complexity and depth into the flavor profile of Chambord. Um, flavor concentrate two contains raspberry, um, but it also contains some honey and herbal type essences. Vanilla um, that is sourced from Madagascar. Um, Moroccan citrus peel, which is citrus peel from orange, tangerine, tangerine, tangerines, and mandarins. Um, and then it also contains our cognac that we add to Chambord as well. So this is what we call flavor concentrate too. Um, there's a bottle. You'll notice it's brown. So this is a lot of these brown notes. Um, I think this smells amazing. You can really um, kind of get that honey and herbal and those complex back notes that you get when you taste the Chambord finished product. Um, also, I think you guys have, have some, oh yeah, they, on your tasting mat is the cognac that we add to the Chambord by itself. So you're welcome to experience the cognac and taste it. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about the cognac piece of it as well. So the vanilla that um, we are using, well just vanilla in general, is an orchid, so it's a flower. Um, there's uh, flowers like sunshine and the right amount of rain or whatnot. So two years ago, we had a terrible vanilla harvest and the price of vanilla for crown Foreman increased by about 200%. So um, if you smell your concentrate, you can see that there's a lot of vanilla coming in through there. So um, that did not have an effect on the consumer. We ate that cost and just prayed that the next year that our uh, the crop was better, and it was. But um, vanilla is an orchid, and it is very, very um, specific in its growing region. So it grows about, um, I think it's plus or minus five degrees on each side of the equator. So um, having the Madagascar vanilla, that's pretty artisanal. Um, it's something that you could say, it, one of the competitors could say they have vanilla, but Madagascar vanilla is something that um, we're proud of to put in our product. There's vanilla, <coughs> if you guys are not familiar. Um, this is the XO cognac that's on your table that we add to Chambord. I, 
really need that extra barrel notes. It's such an excellent complement to those sweet and tart berries. It really rounds out the flavor profile. Um, when we can get all that vanilla and all that toasted oak and everything you get from the all time material. So um, we're pretty damn picky about our cognac, um, and we think it makes a huge impact to our product. So cheers to cognac. It's on your table. Cheers. If you all have ever seen the Shamor brown in your bar, it lends itself to a lot of this part of the flavor system. So um, the infusion will start to turn and lose some of its red. It, it, it inherently just it turns brown, but a lot of what is left is this part seeping through. I think I've a conversation about trying to market some of these uh, separate extracts. You know, uh, did they bring them? From my side, no. Um, Shana, do you know if there's ever been any talk? No. <laughs> I think it's interesting. Yeah. This yeah. is number two. Delicious. It would be an absolute As like a tincture type thing? Just use a sweetener. Um, we will take that back. We will take that on. I like that idea. That is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. Too. I'm just thinking about like how Woodford has some bitters and stuff like that. Sure. Is there something for you? Come on, yes. Oh, I can't. Don't let us forget about it. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, thanks, Jazz. That was awesome. Okay, so we've got the components of Sean Moore. We've got the base, we've got berry infusion, we've got concentrate one, concentrate two, which is our cognac. So we've got all of our pieces. We're also going to have uh, Sean Moore, so now we're ready to blend. So remember good old Fabian, blend, he's the dude that comes in and he blends to his flavor profile specification. So he has got to check all these different components for every batch of Sean Moore that's made. We have a standard recipe with give or take based on the naturalness of the product and that's all based on um, Fabian, his nose, his palate. Um, like I said, he's been doing this over 20 years. All he does is make Sean Moore. So um, he takes the alcohol of base, he adds the amount of infusion that's needed, the amount of concentrate that's needed, and there you have it, that Shambord hot fresh right over here. How much Shambord is produced annually? Like how much? Yeah. Mm, how many cases? That's a really good question. I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's okay. not a huge brand. Yeah, that's what I'm like. I'm curious. Um, which is nice because we can maintain some of that craftsmanship and artisanal aspect of it. And it's distributed like worldwide? US, South Africa, Australia, Canada, so it's in Europe, maybe. but um, surprisingly enough, the Europeans don't recognize it as much as um, Americans, so yeah. I don't know how much worldwide distribution there is, but it's definitely global um, and to some respect. So together, we do um, a polish to the liquid. So not everybody has it on their table, so you might have to share a little bit. The setup's a little bit different. But there's these little 100 ml bottles on your tables that are examples of pre-filtered liquid, liquid and post-filtered liquid. So the liquid goes through a really expensive Italian piece of equipment that's a plate and frame type polishing filter. And this equipment is so sophisticated because it, limit, it does not filter out any flavor or volatile compounds. It more or less polishes the liquid. Yeah, if you hold it up to the light, that's going to be the best way to see uh, the difference is just hold it side by side. So the pre-filtered liquid is kind of cloudy and murky. And then if you look at the post-filtered <laughs> liquid, it's more vibrant red and it almost looks shinier, which is what happens with this filtration. What's the light like, polishing? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the wine lot. industry uses it. What is, what is the one? It's a, um, so this is the filtration. It's right back. It's, it? it's called a plate filtration <laughs> because there are several plates in this filter and the liquid will pass through the first one and it's going to catch stuff. But then, then it will go and pass through the second one and catch more. So it's it's a what very is is this a charcoal is this a it is a, it's screen, a mesh it's a screen mesh filter metal mesh, metal. mesh. mesh. and so we are um, with this filtration we're not taking it through one tight pass of a pad and 
and filtering out all the flavor. We're going through several steps of a semi-loose filtration in order to preserve the flavor and the color. Um, but we're going through so many passes that we effectively remove any type of um, fruit remnants or what have you. So for yeah. Yes. And it really does, you can see in those bottles, it really does polish it. I know that's kind of a generic goofy term, but it's like a lot shinier red in the post filtration. Um, in the lab, we call the post filtration, we call that a clear product, even though it's not clear. Um, if we're talking about something that's clear as in water, we call it water white. But if we look at the two side by side, we'll say, oh yeah, this post filtration is clear. And whenever we were talking about the technical instrumentation, um, the instrument that looks like what we measure color on, it actually is called a um, turbinometer. And it's actually measuring how turbid something is. So we have a spec on our turbidity. Um, anything has to be less than one. Anything over one, we know will have a fallout over time. And so um, some products, can have a less than 10 spec. So if we have a ginger beer, we know it's supposed to be cloudy and we have a less than 10, but this is not supposed to be cloudy and so um, we set our spec a lot tighter. Our whiskeys are less than 0.5, I believe, so. Do you get a lot of like excess pumps after the, after the filter? Um, in the filter, yes. So um, is that, is that repurpose is a, at all or just waste? Waste. Especially in the first couple, um, it takes a brunt of the uh, any type of waste or whatnot. But then by the end, um, it starts to be just sporadic. And these are the examples of the sheets. So you can see it does look like a, if you think of a, like a sieve, um, that's what this type of filter is. The wine industry. Okay, so we've got liquid, it's been filtered, it's nice and shiny, ready to be bottled. So, bottling goes into the filler. Um, this, I'm going to say it wrong, so this morning. Chrono, Chronos, Chrome's machine is the labeling machine. Um, so the Sean Ward bottle has like five labels on it because it's brown. Um, quite a few labels that need to be applied. It's all done with this Chrome's machine now, super high-tech um, machine for the labeling. However, that being said, once the machine puts on all these labels, there's a double QC check. So there's literally people sitting on each side of this bottling line, and there are two people that will pick up every single bottle to make sure that nothing is wrong or out of place, or there's no bubbles. Um, a lot of times in these big kind of production facilities, you'll have like the Laverne and Shirley sitting there and they're jacking the whole time and they'll grab a bottle every now and then. <laughs> it is a little bit over the top at Sean Lord um, because there's only like 15, 15 people that work yes. here. They only run one shift a day. That is all they make there is Sean Lord. Um, they are extremely passionate about their product. So Laverne picks up one and she looks at every single thing and it goes down the next and then Shirley picks it up and looks at the exact same thing again to make sure Laverne is. So I went to Sean Ward a few years ago, and um, I'm used to going to our RTD facilities, and in an RTD facility, we are canning or bottling about 650 bottles or cans per minute. So I was like, this was so painfully slow. <laughs> Um, so the painful 
plastic that used to be on that bottle. Do you guys remember that cage type thing? Yeah. Yeah. That was all done by hand by the woodworkers, not by the machine. Yeah. So their poor little hands were just callous for doing this over and over again. And so um, this machine is uh, pretty state of the art for the industry. Um, if you look at escalators, they're cr they're made back from. So it's a very redundant type of um, this type of manufacturing, this brand, deals with a lot of redundancy. So elevators, just things going on. And so these labels are going over and over and over. So um, at in Louisville, we just upgraded to this brand. So it was like a huge, huge deal when we did this. Um, speaking of the, the cage, so when I first started um, years ago, at Brown Horman, Sean Board had the cage, and do y'all remember the little crown that sat on top? Mm -hmm. um, so we revamped these, um, and a lot of that was through bartender feedback and consumer feedback. Um, the crown, so funny, interesting thing that we learned recently is the, the so this liquid, and this has like a major history, like 1700s type of thing. Um, and this is actually supposed to be reminiscent, and I'm gonna completely butcher this, but Clovis, the orb with the cross on top, the Christian symbol, that like kings that kind of show that God is ruler of the world. Crucifer. I was like, I don't know how much you can put you this. But this is what it's modeled after, this bottle, um, especially when it has the crown. Um, and so anyway, it's, it's supposed to be reminiscent of like kings and their rules of the world. That's why it's got the world, the orb, and the thing on top. Yeah. And there's a lot of colors, so like purple is royalty. Yeah. And, yeah, so... Um, that's part of the history of the color as well. So it was a gorgeous bottle, um, especially when it had all the hand applied crowns and the cage on it. Um, I was actually part of the research that we did that we got back and people said, yeah, it's awesome to look at, but it tears the shit out of my hands when I'm pouring it all day long, your beautiful cage. And when I get my shipment in, half the time your crowns will broke off. So nice try, try again. So um, we did a lot of research and got a lot of consumer feedback. We felt it was, Brown Foreman felt it was really imperative to keep the orb shape because of the history and the ties to the Sean board. I get that it's not easy to pour, um, which is why I think everyone gets to go home with these awesome additional neck pours that gives you something to hang on to. Um, I have really small hands, so I'm like an idiot when I pour this stuff. I don't hold it like this. Um, but it means a lot to the brain, okay? It, it, there's a reason behind the madness of, of the orb bottle. I also think it looks beautiful on a bar. It sets the brain out on its own. Um, and we think we did a pretty nice job by keeping the essence of the brand but eliminating all those painful points in the crown and the cages and stuff. So, um, evolution of the Sean Moore's bottle. When was the first, uh, when was the release? Yes. <laughs> 82 is when the brand was established. Um, Brown Foreman bought it in 06. We removed <clears throat> the cage and the crown in 10. The I didn't. Yeah, already, guys. All right. How about the date? Yeah, I, I, I usually sell the dates. Actually. Yeah, okay. So we've got Chambord liqueur. It's um. Y'all want to drink? Let's drink. Woo! Um, so on the bottom, and those four glasses are our competitive tasting. So with Chambord. So oh wait wait wait. Are we done talking about, well, we've got more things to talk about. We'll do it. Um, but since we have finished product, we made it. Let's toast to it. So shop board is in the green circle. So taste it again with new eyes and a new palate. Try to pick up those different flavor concentrates that we've seen on its own. The berry infusion, the cognac. You can taste all of these pieces now. You can go back and reference um, each individual piece and see how each piece contributes to the final product. Which, um, which citrus is it? Rock and citrus. Is it lemon lime? It's, it's tangerine. Tangerine. Orange. Yeah. Well yeah. 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 done. Is that citrus? Yes. So oh. this is dried um, citrus. Yeah. yeah. Here's your citrus peel. So as a reference point, you can go back and you can kind of smell that in the Sean board. Let's um, let's actually recap a little bit about Sean Board, and then we'll taste the competitors. So hold on to some of it in your glass. Uh, two more questions. So you said the 
with the, with the zest, you were using dry or fresh? We use fresh, but for this purpose, we used dry okay. because we sent everything up from, or down from bowl. So, important thing to take away and remember from Sean Moore, um, we use all natural flavors across the board. We're completely natural colored, no added colors, um, no preservatives. All the color is coming from the fairy infusion and what's lacking is made up with those concentrating those essences. The product is GMO free. Um, it's vegetarian, but it's not vegan. So we've got honey in there. Remember we talked about the honey and the herbal pieces and concentrate concentrate. Um, shelf life that we recommend for this product is 18 months. That is 100% driven by the brownie. I am here to tell you as the person who determines shelf life and does all the sensory testing for shelf life, even when Chef Ward starts to ground, it tastes fine. You're just going to lose some of that color. Um, so we say 18 months because we don't want people to think something's wrong with it when it started grounding after a while. Now you're in the know and you know that it tastes a little bit brown, but it's still going to be okay. The problem is it kind of limits its use to get that nice, vibrant, red color you like in cocktail. Um, that's usually when I take it home and start cooking with it. Um, because the flavor is great. And Amber won first place. We had a, re a recipe contest at work, so we have a thousand people in Louisville, and she won first place with a Sean Moore cake. So we won it. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, but the Sean Moore cake was taken like 10 years. We I know not know about Huh? Deep and complex flavor profile compared to these other products. Um, 
definitely compared to Rasmus. Um, the one to the right of Sean Board is Gifford. 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 Gifford.
So if you kind of look at this flavor wheel and think how, what mixers can I build or what cocktails can I build to kind of complement these flavor profiles, this complete eyesore here pops up. So, I know, sorry, it is what it is. Actually, there's a takeaway that has mixers there for you. But basically, um, looking into this product and looking into the flavor wheel and complementary mixers and everything, um, we really learned that any sort of basic classic cocktail can just be elevated a level of shampoo. It literally works across the board. So when you're talking about like um, whiskey sours or old fashioned or other classic cocktails, um, you can add some more. It works. The cognac in it comes out, it really pulls that piece of it, it makes a really nice compliment. It balances the, the sour notes from cocktails are balanced by the sweeter notes and shop board, so that was going hand in hand. Um, kind of this herbal component to the shop board flavor wheel works really well um, with caprinias and with margaritas. I think that's what we're drinking on today is a black raspberry margarita. Um, so it's just your basic rad, basic margarita with the addition of Sean Borg. It takes it to a different level, a little bit different experience and twist. Um, the complexity of Sean Borg still lends itself really well to those sort of notes that are present in those cocktails. Um, these sweet aromatics, these honeys and vanillas, work really well with these sort of tropical type drinks or cocktails, um, mojitos, um, anything with rum really works well, pulls out those sweet aromatic notes. Obviously, Chambord works great for um, these really indulgent cocktails. This um, chocolate covered raspberry is essentially a white Russian with Chambord in it. It's, she's a white Russian drinker, anything green makes me want to vomit, but <laughs> rumor has it it's really, really good. And it's a really cool twist. You have to be careful when you do add chambord to cream. I'm sure that you all have experienced this. It will curdle. Um, there is anything that has milk fat and you add acid to it, so the natural acid coming through the berries, it it's like oil and water with cream. And so it will curdle. Um, if you just gently stir, it is not uh, horrendous might see a little bit on the side of the glass if you shake um, and as it settles it will be larger um, particulate but it's fine to taste it's just not pleasant to look at so just use caution um, anything like the half and half or the heavy whipping cream is going to do it more because it has a higher milk fat content um, is it one of the biggest cocktails for you guys in the 80s the nuts and berries yes, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we didn't own the brand then, but it still exists. Um, and then I think we're going to, is this a bramble that we need to do yes. now? Sweet. Green tight cocktails like the bramble um, really work well to pull out some of those really refreshing beers. So believe it or not, this is John Morton actually working with refreshing cocktails. Who uses it? Does anybody have cocktail recipes they use in their bar? Can you use John Morton? I'm just interested in real life. I'm not the boy, I'm just going to sort of use some of these. Thank you. That is the entire goal for this whole show is to get you guys to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and, and remember it and not just let it collect dust and see how it may work. <laughs> 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 <
just a reminder that this takes a few years to so honestly, I think at one point it was, and I'm, I'm going to brag on our r and a little bit, we've done some work on this over the years since Ron Norman bought it to make it not so heavy and thick and sweet like that, to make it a little bit more versatile. So I'm glad to hear that we, we went in the right direction. Yeah, I heard it. Yeah. It wasn't your I don't know if you guys can answer this. I, mean, I know you guys talked about the packaging changes, but was there a drastic change in terms of the flavor recipe when you guys took it over, or is that something that's like house secret? Or because a lot of times when new acquisitions happen, brands will be some type of gradual recipe change. So. No, I mean I think we've done some gradual upgrades and changes. We tried to do some things that were just like the same Thank you. 